Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. It's only the 87th day of 2023, but America's experienced its 129th mass shooting of the year. Three children aged just nine and three adults were killed at a school in Nashville, Tennessee. A former student, Audrey Hale, a biological woman who identifies as transgender or did before she was killed and apparently uses male pronouns, but frankly, who cares about the pronouns? Well, certainly by comparison to the appalling cowardice shown by police at the Ovalde mass shooting, where you may remember uh, 20 uh, were killed, the police there deserve full uh, credit for the courage that they showed in taking down that shoot. And joining me now is Ashby Beasley, who herself survived a mass shooting in Illinois only last year, along with Fox News commentator and Outkick host Tommy Lahren, who lives just minutes away from the school, the scene of this latest shooting. Well, welcome to both of you. Um, I want to start with you, Ashby, if I may. Now, you and your six-year-old son were present at a, a shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, uh, last summer, where seven people were killed and 48 injured. And then by an extraordinary coincidence, having campaigned since then for gun law reforms, you happened to be on a family vacation right in Nashville when this latest shooting happened. And you went down to the scene and you spoke incredibly movingly to the media that were there. Let's take a look at this. Aren't you guys tired of covering this? Aren't you guys tired of being here and having to cover all of these mass shootings? I'm from Highland Park, Illinois. My son and I survived a mass shooting over the summer. I am in Tennessee on a family vacation with my son, visiting my sister-in-law. I have been lobbying in D.C. since we survived a mass shooting in July. I have met with over 130 lawmakers. How is this still happening? How are our children still dying and why are we failing them? Well, they're good questions. Uh, Ashby, thank you very much indeed for joining me. What motivated you to go there and, and say such a passionate thing there to the media? You know, only in America can someone like me who survived a mass shooting last year with my six-year-old son um, go uh, to a rally in D.C. that is being put on by the survivors of another mass shooting, um, Newtown, Connecticut, um, and then stop by to visit my sister-in-law in Nashville and meet up with a friend whose son was killed in a mass shooting in a Waffle House in Antioch, Tennessee, who I met in D.C. lobbying. And only on the day when we planned to have lunch could another mass shooting happen down the street from that friend's, you know, son's school, a son who was at the mass shooting that killed his brother, only in America can you find yourself in that kind of a situation. I mean, just hearing... So, you know, when she called... Well, I mean, just Sorry, just to interrupt, but just to hear what you've just said... I've got to say, sitting here in London, that kind of sentence is just extraordinary to people here. It's not to me, because I've lived and worked in America for a long time, but it's just the relentlessness of these shootings, and in particular, the relentlessness of school shootings. There have been, I think, over 80 school shootings in America this year alone. I mean, we had an appalling one in the UK in Dunblane, Scotland, in 1996. And we irrevocably changed a lot of our gun laws. And we didn't have the same amount of guns in circulation, just to be clear. There's a different problem here. Um, this was the front page of the Daily Mirror at the time. I was the editor. I helped drive a campaign to make things safer. And we've not had a school shooting since 1996. America's had over 80 this year. What do you think, Ashby, is the answer to this, because Congress, which would change the rules, change the laws, seems completely locked on this, completely gridlocked, almost like nothing can be done. Well, I'm glad that you um, said 1996, because since 1999, children in American schools have experienced gun violence. Over 350,000 children have experienced gun violence in schools since 1999. So you changed your laws in 96. We haven't changed our laws since then, and the toll is just growing. Our government needs to step in. Our lawmakers need to step in, and they need to pass gun safety legislation. The access to weapons of war, the, access, the easy access to guns, is what's killing us. It's what's killing our children, and there is no other answer than passing gun safety legislation. 90% right. of American citizens support background checks. Universal background checks. Let's do it. Let's get it done. Right. Let's bring in Tommy here. Look, Tommy, now you, you and I have discussed guns, I mean, it seems like forever. This is a Groundhog Day debate. I'm not going to sit here as a Brit and tell Americans how to lead their lives. I tried that once. It didn't go down very well. So let's try a different tactic here, which is 
I think the key phrase which I heard there from Ashby was, rather than using gun control, which is complete anathema to many Americans, particularly in a British accent, because you, as you rightly point out, drove us out with guns, so you don't want to hear it from us. I get it. I get all that. But she mentioned gun safety. What can be done to make things safer? Because things far from getting safer in America, all that's happening is the number of guns in circulation are exponentially increasing, well over 400 million now. And so the number of shootings are increasing, mass shootings, school shootings, everything's increasing. You, as an American citizen, cannot be happy about that, surely. What do we do about it? Well, I will tell you this. I want to talk about the mental health aspect of this in a moment. But first, I want to address the gun rights and the gun safety debate in question. So here in the United States, we use guns to protect everything that we hold near and dear, to protect our politicians, our celebrities, our red carpets, our jewelry stores, you name it, everything that we deem important. We put people with firearms that are trained to use those firearms to protect those entities and those individuals. We do not protect our schools like we should. And if you look into this shooter's background, you look into their manifesto. They had a map of this school because what we use to protect our schools is a little sign that says gun free zone. So when you're looking at soft targets, if you are a psychopath, a freak, a monster, you look for places where you can go and cause carnage and damage where nobody will be able to stop you. Now, thank God for our Nashville officers that responded so quickly and were able to neutralize that monster and that threat. But had we had somebody outside of that school that was trained with a firearm, they could have neutralized that. Well, hang on. Yeah, but tell me, tell me, tell me. We need to look into Tommy, protecting our schools. Okay, but we know what happened at Ivaldo. There were hundreds of good guys with guns and none of them had the guts to go and do anything about it and 20 kids got killed. So uh, it's not a, a given that actually if you have a load of people who are good people with guns in these schools, it makes any difference. We saw what happened on the video here about what this person did. Uh, but on a wider point, I, I tweeted today, for example, look, rather than get into the same old debates, what about... Uh, regulating guns in America as in the same way you regulate cars. And I got an unbelievable amount of abuse immediately, just endless abuse, as if I didn't know what I was talking about. But when I actually then posted a piece by Nick Kristof, who was at the New York Times at the time, and I explained what I meant, and I'm just going to praise what, what the piece was, a brilliant piece. It was a few years ago. But he said, if we had the same auto fatality rate today that we had in 1921... By my calculations, we'd have, we'd have 715,000 Americans dying annually in vehicle accidents. Instead, we've reduced that fatality rate by 95%, not by confiscating cars or taking them away, but by regulating them and their drivers more sensibly. And then he goes into all the things that have happened in that period, right? They talked about requiring driver licenses, uh, putting speed limits, registering vehicles. All of that was originally met with ridicule. When authorities in New York City sought in 1899 to ban horseless carriages in the parks, the idea was lambasted as devoid of merit and impossible to maintain by the New York Times. Yet over time, as more and more people were being killed by cars, they brought in more and more regulation. By the 1920s, a lot of this stuff like car registration, license requirements, other safety measures, and then over time, seat belts, airbags, padded dashboards, better bumpers, rules about drunken drivers, graduated licensing for young people, improved road engineering, blah, blah, blah. The upshot of all that was that there's now just over one car fatality per 100 million miles driven. And so it was a very well-argued point. And at the centre of it was not a claim, which I know goes down very badly with gun owners in America, that you want to ban guns or grab guns. I'm always called a gun grabber. I don't want your guns, trust me. Um, but about making it as safe as cars, doing what happened to cars, why not just do that and see what happens? Well, here's the thing. Somebody that's going to go into a school and murder children is not like your average driver who needs to obey a speed limit or wear a seatbelt. Somebody that's going to go in to murder students clearly does not care about laws in general. So what does making law-abiding citizens, making it harder for us to have firearms, what does that do to stop a monster, a psychopath, a freak? Now, I understand your argument here. So we need gun safety. We need people to be trained how to use firearms, to respect firearms, and change the gun culture in this country. I'll also say, in the last 30 years, gun ownership in the United States really has not changed much. What has? 
our mental health situation. And now, thanks to the radical LGBTQ movement in this country, we are exploiting mental illness, especially in young people. So when you look at this particular shooter, you look at their background, you look at the mental health counseling and services, they were receiving probably gender affirmation because that's the new, that's the new status quo now. Instead of saying this person has a real mental illness that needs to be addressed on an individual basis, we now cloud everything under the guise of gender affirmation and tolerance. The mental health aspect is very important here. Okay, we can have would... a discussion about gun safety, gun okay, rights, but we I have to address mental health, and that's being glossed over. I, I couldn't agree more with you about mental health. All I would point out is we have exactly the same mental health problems in this country and in many European countries. And because we don't have the availability of guns, we don't have 80,000 people a year dying from guns. Uh, we had, I think, one last year. So that's what I would say in return to that. I want to come back to, to Ashby Fani for this. Uh, the, the local congressman... Can I just answer something that she said? Yes, yeah, sure. Can yeah. I answer something yeah. that she said? Yeah. Um, you know, statistically, we know that mass shooters, 77% of mass shooters, get their guns legally. That means that they don't have a criminal record. That means that they're not doing the things wrong. They're not on some sort of list. Well, I was going to make the point, Ashby. Get their guns legally. Yeah, Ashby, I was going to make the point that this particular shooter was uh, a woman, transgender. I just, I'm not interested in that aspect of the story, other than to say that she acquired seven guns legally from five different stores. Right. To which my and, and apparently was at the same time receiving medical treatment from a doctor for being emotionally disturbed. Now, to anyone with half a brain, this seems like an utterly lethal cocktail but nothing in the system stopped her. I, I'm interested also, Ashby, in, in this. This is Congressman Andy Ogles, who is the congressman responsible for that district. So he's a US lawmaker. And in Christmas 2021, he tweeted this Christmas card to the world on his Twitter account. Let's take a look at this. That's him with his family, all clutching guns, including young children. Merry Christmas from the Ogles family, he wrote. The atmosphere of firearms anywhere and everywhere restrains evil interference. They deserve a place of honour with all that's good. Uh, as some people have pointed out, that doesn't seem a particularly responsible or appropriate thing for a US congressman to be doing. And now we see, perhaps, in a disturbed mind, what that kind of mindset can do. Yes, and, and if, if I'm being honest, you know, I look at a picture like that and the glorifications of weapon, the glorification of weapons of war, because the AR-15 was designed for combat in the 1950s. It is a gun that shoots smooth. It's it's an easy shot. I shot one recently. Um, you can put your, your eye on the barrel when you're firing an AR-15 and you will not lose your eye. It is designed for ease, for killing. Yeah. When I see a gun like that in a picture like that, what I think of is I think of Mexican cartels and how Mexican cartels are arming themselves with our guns. They are arming themselves with our guns. Over 200,000 weapons are being trafficked into Mexico every single year. Republicans like this Republican in this picture is complaining about the fentanyl crisis on a daily best basis, but our assault weapons are enforcing the fentanyl well, I think, crisis, I think, yeah, and look, none of our lawmakers are doing anything about it. Yeah, I think the, the truth is they're both hugely uh, important issues in America. They both have huge toll on life. I just think it's completely inappropriate for a congressman to be putting Christmas cards out with his kids all clutching rifles like that. I'm not sure what message he's trying to send. Uh, and I'm not saying he's responsible he's for what happened. guns. Yeah. Um, look, Tommy, uh, and Ashby, thank you both. I mean, Tommy, you and I, we've discussed this a lot. I just hate the Groundhog Day aspect. I love America. I love Americans. I respect the Second Amendment. I understand you can't take all the guns away. There are too many of them. This can't go on. You can't just wake up every few weeks and have another school being shot up by people in combats with, with all these guns. Something has to happen. Something has to change. And the thing I find most frustrating and dispiriting about it is Americans are the most can-do people in the world. They get stuff done. And yet on this, this total paralysis. And when we did the campaign in, in the UK after Dunblane, there was no partisanship or political difference of opinion. It was never political. I never really understood how it's got that way in America. Here, left and right came together and went, the lives of kids come above everything. And I think until that is the starting point, I don't think anything happens in America. But look, I appreciate we all have different views on this. I also appreciate I'm not American. So I appreciate you both joining me and thank you both very much.